This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome, I'm Elisa Marco. I'm one of the child neurologists here at UCSF. And this is actually rather a special thing for me to be lecturing in Cole Hall. I have to say, when I saw that there was going to be a change, I was really excited because I was a UCSF med student. And I have sat in this room, and I sat where pretty much where you guys are up there. Yeah. So, um, so thank you, actually, for being here and being my audience today. I really appreciate it. We're going to talk to you through sort of the age space spectrum of communication from uh, younger kids all the way through older adults. And we're also going to talk sort of from more basic auditory processing to more elegant um, and eloquent language concepts. And so I'm at the, as a child neurologist, I'm clearly going to be talking about the younger kids. And I'm also going to be talking about more of the basic sensory processing because that's more of what I do and what I specialize in. Um, I should also say that if you have questions, we will have some time for questions at the end. So the first thing that we're going to think about is that communication begins with sensory perception and sensory processing, meaning that unless you hear that there's sound coming in, you won't know what you're going to be responding to, and you won't know how to start to learn how to make those sounds yourself. So hearing and being aware of simple auditory concepts is the very, basic of lang the very basics of language and communication. We're going to review some basics of sensory processing from a neuroscience perspective. We're going to talk about how um, it differs in children with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of research that we're doing here at UCSF, both in terms of trying to understand auditory processing as well as remediation. So the first question um, that people often ask is whether there actually is sensory differences in autism at the bedside for kids that you might see even in your, in your family um, or the kids of friends that you have. And the answer is that all you really need to do is ask even, either the parents or the kids with autism when they get older. One of the um, ambassadors of autism is a woman named Temple Grandin. A lot of people actually know about Temple now because there was a wonderful movie made about her that um, a lot of people have seen. So Temple in her book, Emergence, says, even today, sudden loud noises such as a car backfiring will make me jump and a panicky feeling overwhelms me. Loud high-pitched noises such as a motorcycle sound are still painful to me. And I see this all day long when I'm seeing kids clinically, that the sounds that are non-noxious to most three-year-olds, for example, like the hum of a blender or vacuum cleaner, have these kids covering their ears and running to uh, running uh, to another room. I have parents who do their blending out the back door with an extension cord because it's so uncomfortable. And you can imagine trying to learn how to understand and speak when the basics of sound hurt. And so the second thing that I study a lot also, but we're not going to talk about a too much today is tactile processing. And Temple says, tactile stimulation for me and many autistic children is a no-win situation. Our bodies cry out for human contact. But when the contact is made, we withdraw in pain and confusion. So it's not just auditory input. It's tactile as well. And sometimes it varies from child to child who 
both carry a diagnosis of autism because autism is not a unitary diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis that is an umbrella term for lots of different related disorders with lots of different causes or etiologies. But we'll more or less lump it um, today. We can dissect it a little bit better uh, in questions. So sensory processing disruption does seem to be fairly ubiquitous in autism. Up until now, it hasn't been one of the core features of the clinical diagnosis of autism. There's this thing called the DSM-4-TR, which is the sort of the Bible of psychiatric diagnoses. And sensory processing hasn't been really in that Bible. But with the DSM-5, which is coming out any day, Hyper and hypo responsivity or hypo and hypo sensitivity is now one of the core features of autism. And we see sensory differences, behavioral sensory response differences in upwards of 90% of kids who have autism. So it's a critical feature, and I think it's important for understanding what the disorder is and what the barriers to learning are. So, and children with autism in research as well as in clinical experience seem to have multiple domains affected. So where so the domains that I'm talking about are auditory, tactile, visual, vestibular. So whereas you may see a child who has just a tactile sensitivity, you may have a tactile sensitivity. I know a number of my colleagues do. This is cutting out the tags of your shirts, not wanting to wear the socks that have certain kinds of seams. And most people can accommodate for that. But when it's ramped up to a noxious place so that you can't concentrate on what anybody is telling you because you're so uncomfortable, and then you multiply that not just by a tactile domain, but add in an auditory domain as well, and you can imagine how difficult it is to focus and learn. So one thing that's very interesting is that children with developmental difficulties and language impairment, they will also have the sen they will also have sensory symptoms and there was a study that was done which looked at how many domains were affected in different groups and you can see up here there was uh, children with low functioning autism high functioning autism developmental disability sort of general or global and then the language impairment kids and then the typical and so you can see here that typically developing kids will sometimes have some sensory sensitivities but kids with autism will have quite a bit more The other thing that's very interesting is that kids with language impairment, you can see, and this is probably not surprising, but they have oftentimes just one domain that's affected, uh, right here, 53%, as opposed to multiple. Uh, if you compare that to the kids with high-functioning autism, for example, they, some of them will have a single domain, but most of them will have multiple domains. So it's sort of this additive. Uh, uh, problem that they're having. And you know, it probably doesn't take much of a leap to guess which domain is affecting the kids who just have a language problem. It's auditory in these kids. So it starts to make sense. The other thing to think about, so I've had people say, well, you know, a little bit of tactile sensitivity or a little bit of auditory sensitivity, that, you know, I, I, I've learned to deal with it. You grow out of it. The fact of the matter is it depends on how severe it is and how many domains are affected. Because sensory sensitivities and sensory symptoms often will persist into childhood and can be the basis of learning and behavioral difficulties that are severe and debilitating. So, the first thing that I want to do is sort of step back and just talk about what I mean by sensory processing, bringing together a neuroscience and a behavioral science approach. Because what's happening right now is there's this um, clinical emergence of a, of a diagnosis called sensory processing disorder. And there's a lot of emerging discussion about whether this thing exists or not. And in the neuroscience community, the idea of sensory processing and a variation in how people process sensory information is old school. There's nothing new about that. People have doing, been doing sensory-based research for decades. But in more of a behavioral science and in the clinical domain, thinking about um, language disorders and behavioral disorders from a sensory approach is relatively new. So to do this, I often like to start with just some basic neuroanatomy, and hopefully this will also set up for some of the talks that are coming after. So 
information comes into the brain and it's highly organized. You might remember this from, uh, from some of the other lectures. So the primary auditory cortex is right here. It's bilaterally represented. We'll go through the auditory, pro the auditory pathway in a little bit more detail. But you can see, similar to the primary auditory cortex, we have primary visual cortex and primary somatosensory or touch cortex. And it's very specific. And even further divided, for example, in the somatosensory cortex, there's a specific area for where the face touches, a specific area where the hand is, the leg, et cetera. And the auditory cortex is very specifically divided also by frequency. Very nearby and adjacent to the primary cortices live the secondary cortices. And there's a higher order of processing that goes on here. And oftentimes, especially near the secondary auditory cortex, there's multisensory processing that information that comes in. So you'll have some visual information that comes in so that you can pull together your auditory and visual information to make a combined percept. There are also regions, like the supermarginal gyrus, that really is a multi-sensory region where it combines information from sound, touch, and vision. And that is a critical uh, function that the brain is doing for us all the time. You guys, when you're watching me, most of you are probably looking at me, especially the ones who might have trouble with hearing, because looking at my mouth and seeing what I'm saying will really help to clear up the sound information as it comes in. So these areas of the brain that actually bring together multisensory information are critically important. So early auditory processing is, um, is complex. As you might know, so you, the speech sound is made, or any kind of sound is made, and it will travel through the eighth nerve to the cochlea. You can kind of follow along with me up here if it's a little bit confusing, or along with the arrow. And so you will get information coming into the brainstem, traveling up the brainstem, and back over to this, the auditory cortices. Sound is going to come in through the brainstem and actually get represented bilaterally. And so problems anywhere along this pathway obviously will affect how you hear sound. But for the most part, we're going to be focusing on sound information once it's reached the cortex. There is an interesting literature about brainstem representation of sound in autism. And I would have to say it's probably one of the most confusing literatures out there. For the last 40 years, the literature has all basically said that there was no difference. And then in the last five or 10 years, there's been some labs who are seeing some subtle differences. But I think that it's still very much up in the air. And so while there may be some kids with autism who have trouble with their brain stem, for the most part, the preponderance of literature has suggested that that's not really where the core problem exists. So what happens when sound gets to the brain? And what's really interesting is that different places in the brain will be able to discriminate, for example, whether something is a random sound versus a speech sound, for example. And we find that our brains are, uh, have a laterality to them where most of the speech processing will be going on in the left hemisphere, whereas um, more of the visual spatial processing will be going on in the right hemisphere. So our brains, in addition to being uh, uh, very organized spatially, also this laterality becomes important as we get older. One thing that's, and you can see that reflected in this study here, which shows uh, the speech versus non-speech in yellow. Oh, sorry. So. Um, Sorry, it's the words versus the non-words, which are in red. And you can see all of this left activity, this left hemisphere activity, whereas you have very little in the right hemisphere in general. But in terms of the primary auditory cortex, which is in pink, you see it nicely bilaterally represented. You also see as speech becomes more complex, so you have the basic auditory processing here that's a little bit more posterior, whereas the more complex processing tends to take place more anteriorly in the temporal lobes. So this back to front shift as the processing becomes more complex. So 
one of the things that we like to do is try and understand how auditory processing is taken place in kids, and we have a number of tools in our neuroscience research labs to do it. We can measure auditory processing in multiple types of scanners. We can measure it using EEG, which is where you simply put electrodes on the scalp and measure electrical activity. It's non-invasive. Now we even have caps that we can put on kids that give you a pretty good representation of the electrical activity. There's some limitations to EEG. For example, the skull blocks a lot of the, um, the electrical information as it comes through. And also, you don't get great spatial resolution. So I could tell if activity was coming from here or here. But to be able to tell, for example, going back to this picture, that it's coming right from this specific gyrus would never, would never be attainable. So we need other measures to be able to do that. What we like to use here is something called MEG, or magnetoencephalography, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a really interesting marriage of um, sort of EEG-based um, technology and functional or uh, an MRI technology in that what we're actually measuring is the magnetic waves that are generated from the electrical activity in the brain. And by looking at these magnetic waves and measuring them, we can look at when activity is happening in the brain on the order of milliseconds. And then once we put that information together with a structural image, we can see where it's happening on the order of centimeters. And so it really gives us sort of a quantum leap up from EEG. We also do functional MRI, which is based on looking at where blood is flowing in the brain with this idea that more active areas of the brain will have more blood flow to them. It's a lovely technique. We use it a lot here. It doesn't give us um, the temporal resolution of when it's happening on the order of milliseconds that we get with MEG, for example. And so what we like to do here often is use multiple modalities asking similar questions of the same kids because we get complementary information. And especially if we get the same kind of information using multiple modalities, then we know that we're really onto something. So how do neurons talk to each other? What are we measuring in our MEG and our EEG scanners? So a neuron has a cell body. And a cell body can either basically say, fire or don't fire. And when a cell body wants to fire, it sends an electrical current down its axon. The axon receives the electrical current, releases neurochemicals into the, um, into the synapse, and it gets picked up by the receptor on the dendrites of the adjacent neuron. It's that simple. And so what we're doing when we're measuring with our MEG is we have this electrical current and it creates the magnetic field, which if you remember from physics goes in a right-hand rule, so the magnetic waves go around. And our machines, our MEG machines have these things called squids, and the squids can read these tiny magnetic waves. You know, this is very Northern California, but it is true that we can read people's energy fields <laughs> around their brains. It's, uh, it's something that, um, you know, it, it always gets a laugh, but when people say, well, can you read my aura? I say, yeah, we can do it. Let's get you in there. And the kids, they love it. So we're reading auras, <clears throat> and we're trying to pass it off as science. And this is what the MEG machine looks like. And these are where the squids live. And the kids just lay on this bed. It's pretty comfortable. And we can either measure their resting brain activity, or we can do different um, tests paradigms with them, sound paradigms, touch paradigms, and look and see how their brains respond, either similarly between kids with autism and without, or differently. So let's use auditory processing as an example, since this um, series of talks today is really about communication. And so when a, a child, or an adult for that matter, hears sound, you'll get a wave that looks like this in the MEG classically with an early wave, the M100, and a later wave, the M200. And that occurs right where we were looking here at the primary auditory cortex. So lots of people have asked, is it the same? Or is it different between kids with and without autism? And the answer is that these are basically the studies that have been done. And these, one, two, and three, show that it's a little bit faster. 
and these show that it's a little bit slower. So how do you make sense of that? It's tricky, but what you need to do is to then look more specifically, what you can see if you look at these waves is that there's a wave here, here, and here. And the problem is that these studies are oftentimes measuring different waves and calling them the same thing. And they're also, you can see in this Robert study, looking at the response to different frequency tones. And actually, when you look at this study at the, uh, one hertz, uh, the one kilohertz activity, it actually is faster, similar to these others that are all looking at the one kilohertz activity. So in general, it seems like it does depend on frequency, but kids with auditory processing problems who also have autism seem to be processing information differently, and at least at that frequency, seem to be processing it a little bit faster. So we step from auditory processing, right? So that's the beginning of the communication chain. And then what happens next is you want, your brain wants to combine auditory information with other information, like visual information. And the classic example that's used for um, this type of concept is something called the McGurk effect. So I thought we'd do that here today. Um, it's got three components to it. So you can either have it be congruent, so you hear ba and you see the lips saying ba. It can be non-McGurk non -McGurk incongruent, meaning you hear ga, you see ba, but, you, but what you perceive is ga because your brain won't bring these together because for whatever reasons, our, our brain won't fuse these two, the, ba, the ga and the ba. Or it can be congruent or a fusion percept. And so you hear ba, you see ga, and what you perceive is da. Your brains do this. If your brains don't do this, come see me after. <laughs> OK, all right, so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Ba, 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 ba. OK, you can open your eyes. So did you hear ba, 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 ba? OK, that's, that's what you should have heard. OK, now I want you to try and kind of close your ears, but just watch. So block off the sound, but just watch. Ba, ba. Ba, 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 ba. OK. And so what the lips are saying is ga, 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 ga. OK. And now listen and look. Ba, 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 ba. Da, 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 da. Your brain fuses it. And, so the, and this is important. This is something that we learn how to do over time. And so there have been really interesting neuroscience studies looking at people who do this and people who don't do this. It seems like the more you can do it, the more this area of your brain is active. And some recent studies have looked to see how kids with autism do with this effect. And one, they've, one of, there aren't that many studies, but one of the recent studies, this one was done in 2010, shows that here are the typical kids. Okay, So they're sort of performing at a ceiling level. And here are the autism kids. In the beginning, they're not, they're not fusing. But as they start to get older, this is their age and months, they catch up with the regular kids. So there seems like there's a delay. Now you would say, is this true of all kids with autism? That's really interesting. Do they all catch up? The answer is that the kids they're testing here are generally high-functioning kids. And those are kids that language does come in for. And so I don't think it's particularly surprising that as their language is coming in, albeit delayed, that they're being able to do more fusing. So it's an interesting way of thinking about a developmental trajectory. Oftentimes, through the last 10, 15 years, we've talked about autism as sort of a static process. But we really are realizing as we're studying kids older and older and watching our kids that we've studied you know, at three into when they're 13 and 23, that it's clearly a developmental process where the kids' brains are changing over time. And we need to know not just what happens when they're adults, but what happens when they're kids as well. And this prompted the next study. This one just came out uh, in 2012. I think it's actually only online at this point in time. So one of the very interesting um, 
lines of research that's happening now in autism is that they're studying the infant siblings of kids who are already diagnosed with autism. Okay, so do all of those infant siblings go on to have autism? No, but they're at a much higher risk for autism because we know the heritability of autism is really the highest for any of the psychiatric disorders that we know of. So sib siblings of kids who are already diagnosed with autism have a much higher risk of going on to become autistic themselves. So they provide us with an enriched sample of kids who we can study as infants to see how babies do. And in this study, what they noticed is that the infant siblings who were, um, who were at low risk for autism, so these are kids who are not siblings of, of, uh, of kids with autism, show this very interesting differential between, so I should also say, when they study infants, oftentimes what you're looking for is how long the look at whatever it is that you're interested in studying. So it's looking time. And that's what we're measuring here, is how long these infants will look at the mouth. Okay, so they're doing sort of a McGurk um, experiment with these baby infants, and what they want to know is how long, how interested are the babies in looking at the mouth. And here, the low-risk infants are very interested in looking at the mouths of people with, so these are the incongruent faces when the lips say something and the mouth says, when the sound says something and the lips say something different, they look for a really long time because they notice that there's a difference. It's not fused, it's not the same, it's different, and they look for a long time. Whereas when it's congruent, they don't look for very long. It's not that interesting, they've already got it. The, sibling, the infant sibs at high risk, who are over here, they look at both the congruent and incongruent faces for about the same time. There really isn't this appreciation that there's a mismatch between what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And so what the sort of supposition is, is that it doesn't maybe matter as much to them because they're not going through this process of bringing the two modalities together in the same way. They're continuing to have them in their separate domains, whereas these infant sibs are used to fusing them and they're seeing that there's a disconnect there, so that they're spending more time trying to figure it out. So what about other neurodevelopmental disorders? How do other kids do with auditory processing? And is there a difference? One of the things that we're trying to understand is how the structure of the brain may relate to autism. And one of the most interesting disorders for understanding this is something called a genesis of the corpus callosum. Um, Basically, the corpus callosum is a highway in the brain that connects the two hemispheres. When I showed you the, the neuron with the axon coming off of it, the corpus callosum is just a collection of axons that goes from one hemisphere to the other. And you can see it on this, sec on this section right here. It's this white structure down, this, down the middle. And basically, it's connecting, it would be connecting the hemisphere that's in front of the screen and the hemisphere that's behind the screen. What you can see in this picture here is that this robust structure is missing. And this is something that's congenital for quite a number of individuals. Why is it interesting for autism? It's interesting for autism because even though autism is a very heterogeneous disorder, one of the most replicated structural findings is a small corpus callosum. So we're very interested in understanding how the, corp how the corpus callosum, um, whether it's present or whether it's absent, might affect auditory processing and language in general. So one of the studies that we've done here, so Elliot Shear is a principal investigator for a large agenesis of the corpus callosum study who I've been working with for a while. And Monica is my uh, research coordinator, who's now a child neurologist, because the study was done a while ago. And Winnie Dunn is the originator of a scale that's actually in quite a wide use called the sensory profile. And it measures how people behaviorally respond to different sensory information in sound, touch, visual, proprioception. And what we found in people with a genesis of the corpus callosum is that they have quite a bit of auditory related behaviors that are quite different from what you would expect. So here are our controls. About 77% of them perform in this middle range, this average range. So 
They don't seem particularly sensitive to auditory information. They don't seem particularly avoidant of sensory information. They're sort of right in the middle in their behavioral response. Whereas the kids with and the adults with a genesis of the corpus callosum are behaving very, very diff differently, particularly in the domain of auditory processing. What might this look like in terms of higher order language? Well, in our magnetoencephalogram, we've studied quite a number of these individuals looking at their language lateralization. So if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I told you that by and large, most of us who are right-handed will have language lateralized to our left hemisphere. What you can see here in terms of activity, so blue is activity that's happening in a language-related task. Here are the controls on the top panel and the third panel, and here are individuals with agenesis of the corpus callosum. On the top two panels, that's the left hemisphere. And it should not be surprising to see all of this activity here in the left hemisphere processing language. What's striking, however, in the controls is that there's no activity. That's pretty typical because most of our activity for processing language is on the left hemisphere. By contrast, look what's happening here in the agenesis of the corpus callosum kids. They are processing a tremendous amount of language using their right hemisphere. They're still processing using some of their left hemisphere, but they're utilizing all these right hemisphere resources that it's very atypical. One of the things that's very interesting also is that we see a similar type of pattern for kids who are born prematurely. So we have to ask ourselves, why is it that having atypical auditory processing might lead to abnormal lateralization. In our kids with agenesis of the corpus callosum, it almost certainly has to do with a lack of inhibition. So typically, when you have one hemisphere doing a task, it sends information across the corpus callosum to the other hemisphere that says, hold off, I got it covered. But in our kids with agenesis of the corpus callosum, they don't have that kind of in, uh, inhibition that's going to the uh, contralateral hemisphere. And so that's one of the concepts that we're trying to explore in autism as well as in our kids with prematurity who also seem to have more robust activity in the right hemisphere for language than we would expect. So how are we planning on helping, right? So as a clinical child neurologist and a neuroscientist, every time I ask one of these questions, it's, you know, it comes back to, yeah, but what are we going to do with this information? It's all very interesting, but it really needs to be translated into something that's going to be practical and be helpful. So I have this um, sort of very real world experience, and what I find in my own life is that no matter what you try to do, it's very, very difficult to get kids away from video games. I don't know if you guys have experienced this with, um, with the, your children or grandchildren, but it's next to impossible. It's on the phone, it's on the iPad. You can find it even if, like me, you don't have a television in your home. My kids are still probably the biggest video game players of any of them. And so I say, if you can't beat them, join them. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're working very hard to develop tools that if they're going to play are going to promote positive plasticity. So this is a good place to be doing this kind of work. When you bring neuroscience, like Adam Ghazali, who's the director of our Neuroscience Imaging Center, to, this, is, this is actually Adam Ghazali as a neuron, <laughs> together with someone like Eric Johnson, who works for LucasArts. And this is Eric Johnson. I don't know if this is going to play on this one. Um, oh, I forgot to, I'm sorry. This is Eric Johnson actually on the trampoline where he does these unbelievable flips and twists, but I forgot last night to bring over the clip of him you end up with what we call NeuroRacer, which is an engaging driving and shooting task that we've seen um, in Dr. Ghazali's lab some pretty interesting results from. It's a task that um, requires visual motor control and also attention. There's uh, paradigms in it where you have to either drive or shoot, or you have to drive while uh, ignoring signs or shoot while ignoring the road. And so there's a lot of attention presses built into the NeuroRacer game. And then there's one where you actually have to multitask and switch back and forth and back and forth. So like it or not, that's something that we all have more trouble with as each, dec as each decade goes by. And what we're trying to understand is how do kids with autism and also sensory processing do on similar tasks?
So one of the things that we found is that kids with autism and sensory processing disorder have trouble staying in the center of the road. They have trouble with their visual motor uh, integration. Their motor uh, times seem to be exactly equivalent to the controls. So it's not sort of a pure motor issue. It's something about bringing the visual and the motor together. We also see the kids with autism and SPD take longer to shoot with visual distraction. So whereas the kids who are controls are doing pretty well. You can see, and this is a slide from Dr. Ghazali that looks not just at kids who are between 8 and 12, but us as we go from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, 60, and up into our 70s, where each decade of life we have a little bit more tr trouble with distraction while we're trying to stay on a task. So then the question becomes, can we improve on a task like this with practice? So here's our kids with autism down here, and we're just about to start this intervention trial with our kids with autism. But in a training trial that was done with older adults, we see a nice bump when you give them a multitask. So here's three tasks that they were doing. The first is just basically how do they do one month later without any practice. The second is how do they do with just a single task, so just driving or shooting. And the third is how well do they do with a multitask, driving and shooting, to train up this ability to multitask. And the answer is they get considerably better, even better than the kid, than, we, than they were basically in their, in their 20s. So there seems to be some possibility that we can, tra we can train ourselves back up. And then the question becomes, what ha does it stick? And six months later, there seems to still be a benefit from the computer game training. Not so much if you don't do the, multi the multitask trial. So we obviously have a large team of people who's been working on all of our imaging studies. We have the group that works on the MEG and our diffusion uh, processing. We've got the NeuroRacer team. We've got the memory and aging team, the sensory processing team, and also the UCSF Autism and Neurodevelopment Program. And I want to just make sure I acknowledge them because it takes a lot of people to do the work that we're doing here at UCSF with autism. So I think there's a lot of hope for both understanding auditory processing and how it relates to the language impairments that we see with kids who are on the autism spectrum. And I think that um, we're having a lot of fun and we have a lot of um, very exciting um, and novel approaches that kids really seem to be enjoying that hopefully will make a big, big difference, both in practice at home, practice at school, so that they can do the things that they need and want to do in life. So thank you very much for your attention. Do we have time for questions? So there's been a lot of studies looking at language lateral, not a lot, but there's been some studies looking at language lateralization and autism, a lot of single case reports mostly. And in general, it does seem that there is, like in our agenesis of the corpus callosum study, more right hemisphere language activity that's going on for kids with autism. We did a series of three um, high functioning adults here using the same the exact paradigm, kids with autism. And of the three, two of them were right hemisphere lateralized, meaning they were using more of their right hemisphere to process language than the left. And the third was using equal. And that's very, very atypical for what you would expect. Kids with autism, in general, if you get a, stru a structural clinical scan clinically, okay, not in, not in a research study where you're aggregating 20 or 30 kids together, there will rarely be a clinical read of an abnormality. But when you aggregate together, in general, kids with autism will generally have a smaller, not an absent, but a smaller corpus callosum. Because right hemisphere does a lot of, um, of melody. And so the, a lot of my kids, where they're not picking it up with straight language, will do very well with both remembering and learning once you put some music to it. So I get all of my kids when I can into music therapy. It's one of my favorite recommendations. <laughs>
what is music therapy is the question. So um, it's, uh, there are cha trained music therapists um, who basically start to work with rhythm with kids so that kids can start to develop their ability to keep time and then putting um, sound and then words together with that music both to learn them as well as to start to use them. And so the details of everything that someone like Pierre Brennan will do in his music therapy session, I don't know, but it um, can be a very powerful method for a lot of kids. Absolutely, so the most widely used autism uh, animal model is the valproic acid exposed um, rat in utero. So the valproic acid is a medication that's used to treat epilepsy. And it's been known now for years that, um, that rats who are exposed to valproic acid will have sensory sensitivities, but also seem to have an autism phenotype. Now, what does an autistic mouse or rat look like? This is something that people who actually work with kids um, kind of bristle at. But it's less social awareness, less audit sometimes auditory, more auditory sensitivity, less grooming behavior. So for example, if you put a typical mouse in, um, in a cage with another mouse, there's some very classic social behavior, grooming and fighting that goes on. And if you do that with a mouse that had been exposed to valproic acid, then um, they have a, a much less social phenotype. So there is a talented researcher who's looking at sensory sensitivity in the valproic acid mouse model and finding that it very much depends on when the exposure happens, whether you can, and she can hit either auditory or tactile or both, depending on exactly the timing that she uses. I think it's really powerful research that's coming out. And there are also, so there's exposure models, but then there's also genetic models. And one of the most, um, I think powerful genetic model is with a mouse that's actually missing his corpus callosum. So it all sort of comes back around. The question is about whether there's um, research about synesthesia and autism. And a synesthia to somebody who um, will uh, say, see a number and will, will translate it immediately into a color or hear a specific um, t t a tone on the piano like a C and that is always bright pink something like that. So it's emerging, like we're talking about, of multi-modalities or multi-domains. Um, there's no literature that I know of that shows a higher incidence of autism in people with synesthesia. In general, um, those folks are cognitively totally intact. It's very distracting for my kids who have synesthesia, but it's not in any way socially impairing. Okay, so the first question was, um, how does empathy fit into this equation? That's so funny because I, I had a feeling I was going to get a question like that because I really start to think about things from their building blocks. And empathy is such a higher order concept that um, it depends on who you ask, right? So if you ask me, which I guess you did, where, how empathy fa factors in, part of it, I think, is that it's very hard to connect with someone else if the world around you, including that person, is noxious. It's very hard to want to look in their eyes if looking at their eyes um, invokes a fight or flight response. And it's very hard to even think about or want to engage in the process of thinking about what they might be thinking about if, um, if all you can do to kind of keep yourself okay is to shut down the information that's coming in. And so it very, the empathy question depends on who you ask, but if you ask a sensory processing person, I would say it's downstream of the basic processing problems. The second question was to go into the details of um, different neuroimaging techniques. Are you doing DTI and fMRI? No, okay, so um, just in, in brief, um, EEG, EEG, electrodes on the head, measures electrical activity. Very good for time activity. So what part of the brain is active at any particular millisecond in time? Very good for teasing out the oscillations or the firing rate of the electrical activity. So is it fast or slow? Um, and also uh, limited very much spatially. Because you have, even with a dense electrode array, 
because you have the skull in between, it very much limits your ability to go from the sensor or the electrode back to the source, the actual neuron population. Okay, so that's EEG. MEG takes the electrical activity, which creates a magnetic wave. It picks up that magnetic wave. And so you can also get the time in milliseconds of the activity. You can get the oscillation of the firing, so how fast or slow are the neurons actually firing. And then when you put the MEG information together with the MRI, which is a structural picture like I showed you of the brain with the, say, the um, agenesis of the corpus callosum, you just put the information together, you can actually see where that magnetic activity is emanating from in about a, set, a centimeter spatial range. It's so looking at the magnetic activity that's generated by the electrical current. So it's pretty direct, neuron firing. fMRI looks at blood flow. The idea being that the blood flows more to areas of the brain that are more active. It gives you really nice resolution for space, so where in the brain is active for a particular task, but it generally aggregates over seconds. And what I showed you, for example, when I was showing you the MEG activity where we talked about the M100 and some people think it's faster or some people think it's slower, the differences there between the, the autism groups and the um, control groups is usually an order of like maybe 15 milliseconds. So fMRI would be way too slow to pick up differences between the two groups. So not a good modality for that question. But if you wanted to know whether there was a difference in where the information was being processed, fMRI would be a much better tool. So I believe that you use the right tool for the right job, and using multiple tools to ask similar questions can give you much better information in the end. Does that work? OK. That is a great question, and it's totally not well understood why, for example, the most common sensory sensitivity that we get is to low pitch hum, blender, vacuum cleaner, um, electrical light sound. Um, and so I think it's something about the resonance at those frequencies not being cl maybe clear enough and being sounding sort of like noise. Um, that if, especially if it's turned up at too high a volume, it's, it's like um, when your um, TV, I guess it doesn't happen that much where TVs go, go blank anymore. And then, <laughs> and then it just goes You imagine if that's way too high? That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be nice. But no, we don't know. There's, you know, um, fortunately, there's still things that we don't know, or else we'd all be out of a job. <laughs> okay, and then there was you. So the question is, um, I think the question is whether other genetic syndromes have problems with their corpus callosum that might also predispose them to auditory processing problems. Um, and the answer is, I think um, we don't know. I don't. Nobody, to my knowledge, has ever looked at Jacobson syndrome specifically to see what the auditory processing looks like. It'd be a hard study, I think, to do just because of numbers. Um, but we are looking more and more at understanding the corpus callosum and seeing how generalizable the finding is to kids in multiple different with multiple different diagnoses. So Jacobson is actually not on our list, um, but I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, did I put my email address? I can, um, I'm easily Googleable, um, and, um, and so um, my name is Elisa, E-L-Y-S-A, Marco, M-A-R-C-O, and my e email address is all over the internet, so you're welcome to email me with further questions. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to apologize right off the bat for the quality of my voice. Um, I've, I've been having a cold and laryngitis, and so hopefully we'll make it through without uh, uh, any too much language comprehension problems. <laughs> all right, so as you, first of all, thank you, Dr. Marco, for that great talk. I don't know if she had to slip away already, but uh, it was very interesting to hear about. And, what I'm going to do is pretty much uh, fast forward through the uh, developmental lifespan into uh, the adult brain and adult speech and language. 
So I'm gonna talk about speech and language deficits that occur after injury to the adult brain. Uh, yes, injury, of course, occurs to the uh, to children's brains as well. Uh, children do have brain injuries, including stroke, um, but there are not as many of them, really, and, and what we like to do is to study how a normal brain acquired normal language and then had a very sudden injury that caused that speech and language ability to be disrupted. By doing that, we can um, learn a number of different things. So first of all, we can learn uh, more about the injury uh, to that person themselves. So the more we understand about the injured brain, the more we can help patients toward a, a more rapid and a more effective recovery. So of course, if we don't understand what's wrong with the person we're working with, we can't really do a very effective job in helping them to get better. So that's obviously the first and foremost uh, job for us as clinical researchers who work with people uh, who have sustained brain injuries. The other thing is that uh, patients with brain injuries actually teach us a, a great deal about how the normal brain processes language. And <clears throat> the reason is because in order to understand the, the way language works in the normal brain, we have to see how it breaks down. By looking at how it breaks down, we can understand more about the different components of language processing and then sort of take the whole language system apart that way uh, while we try to understand how to put it back together. All right, so <clears throat> briefly, what we do um, at our aphasia center is to conduct very extensive speech, language, and neuropsychological evaluations of our aphasic patients so that we can really understand what has gone wrong. By aphasic patient, I mean people who have sustained some kind of language disorder so that they no longer have the ability to do what we're doing right now, my talking to you and you hopefully through the raspy voice being able to understand me. So we also uh, work very closely in terms of understanding their language and cognitive skills, their neurological deficits, and then we also do a lot of neuroimaging with the folks who come to see us. So we do uh, particularly a lot of MRI scanning. Dr. Marco told you a little bit about that before. Um, we ask people to go into the MRI scanner and we look at, we get pictures basically of the brain, like as you can see here. And then we use the computer to help us reconstruct where the injury occurred. So this is an example of someone who sustained a stroke, which we'll talk about in greater detail and more in, in just a moment. So by looking at exactly where the stroke occurred and knowing what the injury was, we can then test what we call brain and behavior relationships. So what we do then is to identify patients who might have sustained the same kind of deficit. Maybe they all have a certain type of aphasia that we'll talk about in a moment. Or maybe they all have a certain kind of problem with understanding language or processing auditory information or, or coordinating movements so that they can articulate the words they want to articulate. So once we isolate all of those patients who have the same problem, what we can do then is to use the computer to overlap their lesions, and because we've computer reconstructed all of those lesions, and then see whether they in fact share the same area of injury. So if they share the same deficit, do they share the same area of injury? This is one way that we can look at brain behavior relationships. And this helps us to understand which areas of the brain specifically might participate in the different pieces of speech and language. Speech and language is actually a pretty complicated thing if you think about it. You have to, if you want to put a sentence together, you have to think of the words you want to say. You have to think about the order they need to go in. You need to think about whether there are any specific endings that have to go on the nouns or the verbs that you want to use. You have to think about um, whether this happened in the present tense or the past tense. You have to put together all the sounds that make the sentence you want to say. And all of this comes out in millisecond speed. It all happens to us very, very naturally until, of course, we sustain a brain injury. And then we have more difficulty with it, as we'll see in a moment. <clears throat> Another way that we can investigate brain behavior relationships 
is with a new voxel-based lesion symptom mapping technique that we've developed. And basically what this is, we won't go into the details here too much, we don't really have much time, but we um, essentially can pick a certain kind of a behavior like how easily people can get the words out, something we call fluency, versus how well they understand language. And we can then use the computer to um, help us statistically test which patients who have lesions in different regions have more difficulty than those who don't have injuries in those areas. And so we can get it down to really more the, the resolution of a single millimeter uh, voxel within the brain. So this is pretty exciting and pretty neat way to map uh, language and cognitive areas in the brain. And then another thing that we can do these days is we can evaluate the role of the fiber pathways. So Dr. Marco told you about um, the, how neurons work, how they talk to other neurons. And basically when neurons are talking to other neurons, they're sending out axons <clears throat> that connect brain regions to each other. And when those bundle together, we get these beautiful fiber pathways that nowadays we can image in the scanner. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about that as well today. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's talk first about the effects of uh, brain injury on adult speech and language. There are many reasons or ways a person can sustain a brain injury as an adult. Unfortunately, uh, stroke is probably the most common, certainly the most common that we see uh, in our clinics. Uh, people also sustain, uh, of course, tumors, cancers of the brain. People can sustain head traumas by bicycle, car accidents, falling off the ladder while cleaning the rain gutters in the fall. Uh, severe epilepsy can, of course, cause brain injury if it's repeat, repeated um, and causing uh, uh, neurological changes. Neurodegenerative diseases can also cause speech and language problems, and Dr. Henry's gonna talk to you about that in a bit. Uh, anoxia, meaning a period of time when the brain doesn't get oxygen, then brain tissue dies. That can also result in speech, language, and cognitive disorders. Infectious diseases, toxicity are others. But I'm gonna to talk to you today about stroke. And so I know most of you know what a stroke is, but let's just review it quickly because it's pretty central to what I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, there are two ways, essentially, that um, a stroke can cause tissue to die in the brain. One of those is through a blood clot. So a little piece of plaque could come up off of the heart or a little piece of uh, atherosclerotic plaque could come up off of the, the arteries. And basically what it does is it travels just fine through these big arteries here. But as the arteries get smaller and smaller, and as you can see, they're getting smaller as they go into different regions of the brain, then those pieces of plaque can get caught. It's kind of like a garden hose that can, you know, take a big rock up to a point, but if you're going into your sprinkler hose, then of course those big rocks and pebbles can't pass through. That's what happens, and essentially that clot will block off the flow of blood to the brain. When the flow of blood is cut off, the flow of oxygen is also cut off, and the brain needs oxygen to survive. So without that oxygen, that brain tissue unfortunately dies off, and it does it pretty quickly. So of course the bottom line message is, if you or someone you see uh, struggling with speech and language or with their motor skills, you think they're having a stroke, call 911 right away. Another reason a person can have a stroke is through a cerebral hemorrhage. That is not that the artery is blocked, but rather that there's a little piece of the artery that becomes weak, like as with an aneurysm. And the wall of the artery gets so weak that it actually breaks and blood spills out over the brain tissue. And when that happens, like in this case here, we see that the brain, the, uh, brain actually becomes smothered by the blood and the blood volume can become so large that it actually puts pressure on brain tissue and causes brain tissue to die in that way as well. So there's two main reasons uh, or causes for stroke that unfortunately bring people in to see us. Of course, we're always happy to see them, but uh, it's not, uh, we'd, we'd rather that they stay healthy. All right, strokes and aphasia, well, strokes can lead to very severe speech and language disorders. In fact, 
that will disrupt a person's ability to communicate, and it can happen very suddenly. So one day a person is just uh, you know, going to the football game, chatting with his friend, and all of a sudden stops being able to talk, stops being able to understand what somebody's saying to them. And when that happens and there's a disruption of the core language functions, we call that an aphasia. So if a person has trouble reading, but they understand auditory language, we would not call that an aphasia because the person is understanding the auditory language and can speak. It's just that modality that they're having trouble with. All right. Similarly, if a person is having difficulty writing what they want to say, in communicating what they want to say, but has no difficulty in saying it orally or can, has difficulty speaking but can write, we tend not to call people like that aphasic because their core language functions are actually probably not disrupted. All right? It's just the modality going in and going out. It's like the, a tire on a car that is out that makes the car not run very well, but the engine is still intact. In aphasia, the engine is not intact anymore. There's a core language problem. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at some examples here. Here is an example um, of an individual who had a stroke in more anterior or front part of the brain, which we can see here. Uh, I hope you can see that in yellow. Um, when strokes happen in the front part of the brain, they tend to affect a lot of the motor systems uh, that help to support speech and language, but they also affect areas of the brain that help us to do things like organize the material that we want to say and uh, put that all together into a sentence that makes sense. So when there's an injury to the front of the brain, we sometimes get an aphasia that looks like this. All right, so tell me about the meal you had at Max's. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, way over the uh, two weeks, Livermore. You're going to go there? No. Last. Uh, Hungry? <laughs> hey, that's what I like. So you can hear that this individual is interested in communicating. He likes to talk. He loves food. He was a maitre d' here in San Francisco and always enjoyed uh, food and, uh, and uh, good uh, wines and, and very much uh, good coffees. And... Um, wants to communicate, but has a lot of trouble in organizing how he wants to produce that speech. So he has what we call a Broca's aphasia. This is something you may have read about in the literature or heard about. Broca's aphasia is a fairly common type of language disorder. And these are sort of the clinical criteria that we use to describe it. Incidentally, I apologize for not having the slides ready for you earlier. Um, I just could not get out of bed. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> pardon me, I will have them ready for you this evening and you should have them available tomorrow. So you don't have to write all of this down, in other words. So we say that uh, individuals with Broca's aphasia have halting or telegraphic speech. That is, if you had to uh, economize on how you use language, you would probably go for the, the content words that conveyed the most meaning. And that's what these patients tend to do. There's controversy as to why they do that. Is it because they struggle so much, it's hard for them to get the words out that this is why they economize? Or do they economize because they have trouble with the little grammatical markers in the language? And it turns out it's actually a, a bit of both. These are patients who really do have trouble even understanding complex grammatical structures. So let me give you a quick example. If I have two pictures, one of a boy kissing a girl and one of a girl kissing a boy, and I say, point to the one that shows the boy is kissing the girl. And this, uh, this gentleman and others like him will point immediately to the correct picture of the boy kissing the girl. So my brain is a little fogged, so if I get this one wrong, help me out. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> now if I say, show me the picture the girl is kissed by the boy, right? They'll point to the same, sorry? They'll point to the same, the other picture. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. 
uh, they point to the wrong picture. And the reason is because they are hearing girl, kiss, boy, probably. They're not understanding that now we've thrown the good old passive voice at them. Remember the one you learned in eighth grade grammar school? Um, and so these are uh, uh, patients who are not getting that grammatical nuance. It's important to remember for us as clinicians and also people just communicating with people who have Broca's aphasia, and that is to try to keep the sentences nice and simple so that they can understand them correctly. Because they'll give you the impression that they understand absolutely 100% of what you're saying, when in fact, when the grammar gets more complex, they really don't. So that's something just to keep in mind. Another thing we always see is that um, word finding is always a problem for uh, any individual who has an aphasia. Um, we also hear um, a, uh, what's called a dysarthria, a motor speech problem. Frequently we will hear um, uh, just changes in sort of the quality of the uh, person's utterances. And we'll also hear what's called an apraxia of speech. This is a problem in actually coordinating complex movements so that they come out the way we want. So our patients might want to say the word cushion, and it comes out prushin or fushin, and they think, no, that's not right. That's not what I want. They can even spell it, C-U-S. But they try and try again, and they will always make uh, an incorrect Error. Now, eventually, they'll get it right. They might say, cushion, that's it, cushion. Okay, so it's, not, it's very irregular and infrequent. That's called an apraxia of speech. And we see that very often in patients who have these kinds of non-fluent aphasias. And then, of course, reading and writing is also always impaired. Here's an example of um, this gentleman trying to write uh, a description of a picture. It's a little picnic scene, and he sees, uh, he's probably trying to write kite and fish, maybe boy, maybe cup, radio, dog, possibly tree. You could see that he has difficulty writing as well as uh, using speech in the oral modality as well. And what we tend to see here are fairly large um, uh, areas of uh, injury in these individuals. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a, a, a brain scan that we've basically put back together in three dimensions with these new scanning techniques that we have now. It's pretty fun. Uh, but here we can see a dark area that's abnormal, and this is actually where this gentleman's stroke occurred. So very much in the frontal lobe of the brain, but also involving what we call the temporal lobe, as Dr. Marco talked about earlier little bits of the parietal lobe as well are involved. And I don't know if, how well you can see this given the lighting, but there's dark little areas right in here. And what that means is that the stroke has gone so deep, it's gone up into the ventricles of the brain where the fluid flows through the brain. And so we're seeing actually cerebral spinal fluid all the way through there. That means we've also gone through into the insula and into the fiber pathways underneath these areas of the brain that are also important for language. Let me t show you now a stroke, um, uh, how a stroke in a more posterior region of the brain can affect um, speech and language. This is a gentleman uh, whose stroke was uh, farther back here in the posterior part of the brain. And you'll see that his problem is very, very different from the gentleman we just saw. What's this that this person has? Yeah, they had their the there. young men. They were the uh, tree. No, yeah, tree of the yellow that they used the um, marrows of the light, the light of the wood. To be honest, I can't remember what it was he was describing, and from what he says, I, I really don't have a clue. He is, um, if you ask him a question like, uh, tell us your name, he might say, well, my right hand and my left hand, and we're talking about really very, very profound language comprehension problems that are also reflected in their speech as well. This is a pretty severe form of what we call Wernicke's aphasia. Um, this was named after a, a, a physician of the 
uh, 1800s, and it really reflects a very extreme uh, impairment of language. But you can also hear that this person doesn't have difficulty articulating language at all. Uh, the words come out very freely. It's probably because a lot of the motor mechanisms in the back of the brain, uh, sorry, um, are uh, affected and not so much in the front of the brain, sorry, the motor mechanisms in the front of the brain are not as much affected as the language areas in the posterior part of the brain. And usually I'm happy to say patients who are this severe actually improve quite a bit during the first three to six months after their stroke. So they very seldom uh, uh, end up being that severely impaired. That doesn't stop this man though from going out and playing golf every day and enjoying his friends and his family and his numerous grandchildren. Um, so you can have a pretty severe communication disorder and still really uh, enjoy a lot of different aspects of, of life. Typically here again, we see that these uh, regions of the brain that are affected are more in the back of the brain rather than more frontal areas that we saw with the previous patient. <clears throat> And let me just also play for you an example of how a much larger stroke can affect um, speech in such a severe way that only automatic sounds are available to this person. So these are people who can then uh, typically will use the same phrase over and over again. So this may surprise you a little bit. Now tell me, why is it that you're moving actually? Ah, uh, tunnel, 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 a tunnel, 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 so that's about five years after his stroke. Um, he still um, comes to all of our stroke group meetings. He interacts with people. He enjoys company. Uh, he's a great singer. Um, and at all our holiday parties, he used to always lead uh, the group in singing all of the holiday songs. Um, as long as he had the music, or a, a, a visual model to, uh, to look at, he actually did very, very well. But unfortunately, this was the, the recurring utterance that he was left with. But he used it in very effective ways. So he could use the intonation, his facial expressions, his gestures to modify what he wanted to say, and actually did a pretty good job of, uh, of getting his message across. Um, Quickly, let me just give some quick tips for communicating with individuals with aphasia in case you should ever happen to um, uh, come across anyone. Uh, just keep the sentences simple, but you want to avoid talking down. These are not individuals who've lost their intelligence. They've simply lost their ability to communicate. You can reduce the rate of speech. You can emphasize some of the keywords. These things work very well. You don't have to speak up. They tend not to be hard of hearing. Again, it's a communication problem, not a hearing problem. Um, make sure you have their attention. Sometimes drawing or using gestures in addition to speech can be helpful. Give them plenty of time to talk and get their message across. As clinicians, this is really important for us to remember um, because we tend to sometimes you know, need to get through the appointments quickly, uh, but we really need to give the aphasic individual time to talk, and that's very true in family situations and social situations as well. Um, yes, no questions work really well because they're very good at responding to those and can be part of the conversation that way. And uh, if you want them to do anything, just give a lot of practice trials. They'll figure it out, and, um, <clears throat> and they'll do what you need to do what you need them to do. In veg uh, again, in ve individuals with aphasia have not lost their intelligence. They may find it difficult to process incoming information or to solve difficult problems. But uh, uh, this is frequently compounded by the fact that they don't have language to help them solve those problems. So if we think of um, you know, how we would approach a difficult problem where we would normally talk it out to ourselves, these individuals don't have that ability anymore, and they find it diff easy to solve simple problems and much more difficult to solve more complex problems that need that kind of verbal mediation. 
And um, again, although they have difficulty expressing their thoughts with words, their thoughts and ideas are typically not affected. This is not like what we see in um, a schizophrenia or a psychosis. These are people who know what they want to say. They're just having trouble conveying those ideas. Now, I see that we are running out of time. <clears throat> I'm going, and I want to leave Dr. Henry plenty of time. I'm just going to give a highlight on what research with people of aphasia has taught us about language processing in the normal brain. And the main thing I want to show you is just some of our new techniques. Basically, we used to think that the brain was, uh, that areas of the brain involved in language were basically this area associated with Broca, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, and kind of this bundle of fibers that connected the two of them together. And that model kind of, I went the wrong way, looked like this, a pretty simplistic model. It worked pretty well for 100 years, but now we have very cool new toys that can help us to explore uh, the brain and the speech and language system a bit better. And we really see many new regions that are involved in language. I uh, can't go into them at the moment, but I want to show you that um, there are numerous brain regions involved in speech and processing, not just two areas and a fiber tract. We've also learned that brain areas don't work in isolation. These are uh, the fibers that connect these regions together help to support complex functions like language and cognition. So here's an example, example of a fiber bundle <coughs> that we used to work with. That's the arcuate fasciculus right there. This is actually teased out in a, in a dissected brain. This is what we had to do in order to understand these fiber pathways. Now, with uh, diffusion MRI, we can use the MRI scanner, basically, to visualize these fiber pathways in the living brain. So these are fiber pathways imaged. They're actually kind of ghosts of fiber pathways that we can pick up with the scanner using diffusion MRI, as uh, Dr. Marco told you a little bit about. So for example, here, here's an MRI scan. And all of this white here, this is all fiber pathways. These are all little axons extending to try to talk with other regions of the brain. Well, we can't really tell what fiber pathways are in there. But with our diffusion MRI, we can now find out, ah, these are fibers of the arcuate fasciculus. This is not just a simple tract that goes from point A to point B. This is a really beautiful tract. I'm going to show you these pictures because I just think they're so pretty. All right, these are, this is the arcuate fasciculus with all kinds of extensions into different areas of the brain. It's just not going from point A to point B. It's going out into all of the different gyri of the brain, connecting multiple regions of the temporal lobe to the frontal lobe. And we can see all of that in vivo. We can see it in our patients as well. Here's an individual who had a stroke right in that fiber pathway. In the right hemisphere, it's perfectly normal, and it looks like this. In the left hemisphere, you can see how it's been affected by the stroke. It's OK up in the front, but in the back, it's not looking as nice and full as it was in the right hemisphere. This is another fiber pathway called the superior longitudinal fasciculus. I promise there's no quiz after this. Nice, rich fiber bundle that we see very nicely in the right hemisphere of this gentleman. But here, you can see how severely it affected it was by the stroke up here uh, that cut through that pathway. <clears throat> that helps us to understand the role that the fiber pathways play. And it turns out that this pathway is very important for helping to, to convey language information from the temporal lobe of the brain <clears throat> to the motor speech mechanisms in the frontal lobes of the brain. And that third gentleman you saw, <coughs> I beg your pardon, the third gentleman you saw with the recurring utterance, tonal, tonal, that's all he could say over and over again. He had a lesion in this very tract that prevented the information he was thinking about to go forward to the motor speech mechanisms in the front that would have allowed him to convey what he wanted to convey. So the fiber pathways are just as important for um, understanding the, uh, the mechanisms in the brain that support speech and language. Um, so they've taught us a lot about how to process, what areas process language. I'm going to skip through this. I hope that I've showed you a bit about how using different techniques has now enabled us to study language in the brain more, understanding which, lang which areas process language, which are cognitive functions that support language, which are language functions that support cognition. 
it's all a complicated thing that takes a lot of different regions of the brain. And I hope that I've showed you that a complex system such as language requires a very extensive and interactive network of brain regions and fiber pathways that connect them. Um, and understanding the network, of course, provides us with the tools for assisting our patients in their recovery from brain injury and also for understanding how language is processed in the, nor processed in the normal brain. Thanks very much for your attention, and I apologize for the raspy voice. <laughs> Thank you. So um, my name is Maya Henry. I'm a speech-language pathologist with the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, a different kind of acquired speech and language problem, one that's not caused by stroke, but rather is caused by neurodegenerative disease. So just a word on language and normal aging, because this is something that comes up a lot um, when I'm talking to people about the kinds of patients that I work with. Um, as people age, there's a very common complaint that I hear that as we get older, people say, I just can't remember the words. I can't come up with the names of people or places as quickly as I used to. Um, and it's true, there's actually evidence showing that word finding does decline with age in healthy older people. Um, but when we look more closely at the nature of that problem, it seems that this is not a problem with um, underlying knowledge about things in the world. It's, it's more of a problem with accessing those words. The words aren't gone. They're just harder to get at when you need them. Um, in fact, when we look at uh, other kinds of tasks across the lifespan, we see that older adults actually outperform younger adults on things like vocabulary tests where you're choosing the correct meaning of a word rather than having to um, generate a word spontaneously. Um, and the other thing is that when we look at semantic memory, which is your conceptual knowledge for things and people in the world, your understanding of, of things in the world and their relationships to one another, that memory store actually is preserved into older age and continues to grow. So this tip of the tongue kind of phenomenon where you just can't get the words when you need them is actually more trouble with with getting the words out, not with sort of a loss of concepts or of vocabulary. So when is this slow change in speech and language actually not normal? I, I, I get asked this a lot also. So I have those kinds of problems with, with finding words that you describe in your patients. So how do I know that there's not something really wrong with me? Well, actually, um, we think something's the matter when we see a decline that's more rapid and when we start to see problems in younger people, so people who are under the age of 60, also when we see problems with cognitive processes that aren't typically affected by age in a noticeable way, like motor control for speech or the ability to articulate, um, the ability to speak in complete and correct sentences, grammatical sentences, is preserved into old age. Your conceptual knowledge and your knowledge of word meanings, that's not something that should change considerably. And your ability to, to hold on to information that you hear. This is something that can get a little bit harder as we get older, but things like being able to hear a telephone number and walk across the room and write it down, to hold on to it over that short period of time. <laughs> so when we see changes that are outside the range of normal, we, we often um, see this in patients who ultimately are diagnosed with what's called primary progressive aphasia. And Dr. Dronkers has set the stage for this very nicely because I don't have to go into any detailed description about what the term aphasia means. You're all with me on that. But in this case, we're talking about something that's not caused by a stroke with a sudden onset, but rather a slowly progressing aphasia that's caused by neurodegenerative disease. And we, uh, we diagnose this in individuals uh, for whom speech and language processes are affected first and foremost. And this helps us to distinguish this kind of problem from other types of dementia, where we see that people have prominent memory problems, difficulty with visual spatial problems. Um, really, this is primarily an aphasia through the first several years of disease. And there cannot be an underlying focal lesion or stroke that's causing the problem. If we think this might be progressive aphasia and then we do an MRI scan and there's a big stroke in the brain, 
something that looks like this, then a PPA diagnosis is out of the question. So again, Dr. Dronkers showed us how different kinds of lesions in, in different parts of the brain can lead to different speech and language deficits. This is a big stroke affecting the left hemisphere. In primary progressive aphasia, we, see, we don't see this kind of big black hole on an MRI scan. Rather, we see a loss of cortex in specific areas of the brain. So you can see how the dark, which is cerebrospinal fluid, has started to fill in where there used to be cortex. And you start to see these kind of finger-like projections of where brain tissue used to be. You see in the normal healthy brain that brain tissue is really filling out the skull. And in someone with primary progressive aphasia, you start to see that there's a loss of brain tissue and cerebrospinal fluid kind of filling in that void. Primary progressive aphasia affects core speech and language processes just like aphasia resulting from stroke. We see a lot of the same kinds of problems. People have difficulty with syntax or grammar, so understanding and producing complete and complex sentences. People have trouble with motor speech, so the ability to smoothly articulate words and to have um, a strong voice. Difficulty with semantics or meaning, so um, an underlying kind of degradation of conceptual knowledge about things in the world. And that's actually not something we see quite to the same extent in stroke patients. This core loss of semantic knowledge is more specific to progressive aphasia, actually. Um, we see problems with the phonological system. Now, phonology just refers to the sound system for language. Um, as we listen to speech and also as we produce it, we're processing sounds. And then finally, um, we see that progressive, progressive aphasia can involve the orthographic system or written language. We can see deficits in any of these number, any of any of these uh, domains that I just mentioned, but they don't um, occur in, in random constellations. What we see is they, they tend to arise in patterns or clusters um, that fall into syndromes that we've now identified, three different variants of PPA. <sighs> These include a non-fluent variant, where people have trouble with um, sentence production and sentence comprehension and or with articulatory aspects of communication. A semantic variant, which, which, which manifests as a, a degradation of core conceptual knowledge, so a loss of knowledge about things and people in the world. And then finally, a logopenic variant, um, which has underlyingly an impairment of phonological processing or processing the sounds involved in speech and language. And these different variants we're now learning are linked to different underlying patterns of atrophy in the brain and actually to different disease processes. So each of the variants is now being associated with different kinds of pathology. And this is really important because it means that a speech language pathologist involved in an interdisciplinary evaluation can really help with the diagnosis. And as we start to learn more about potential pharmacological treatments, maybe having a good speech and language diagnosis can help us to think about what disease is causing the problem and what kind of drugs might need to be used to treat it. So I'd like to give you a sense of what these different kinds of patients look like. So I'm going to play, play some clips for you. Um, this is a gentleman with the non-fluent variant of PPA, and you'll get a sense that he does have difficulty with articulatory aspects of speech and also with grammatical aspects of language. Initially come to UCSF. Okay. Okay. Um, so you said you have progressive aphasia. Mm -hmm. um, rare disease in brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys could hear that okay. He said progressive aphasia, 
rare disease in brain. You can tell that his articulation is slow and labored, although not particularly errorful, and he's lost some of those grammatical elements of sentences and is just giving us lots of nouns kind of in a string, that kind of telegraphic communication that Dr. Dronkers told us about. Now in the semantic variant, we see a very different kind of profile. Um, you're not gonna hear any connected speech here. Well, maybe just a little bit. Um, but semantic variant has a very prominent word finding difficulty. And so what you're seeing here um, is a patient trying to come up with the names of these pictured items. That's a tree. Mm -hmm. Something like this. Yeah. I don't remember what it is. Okay. What is it? It start. I'll get, I'll tell you what the sound that it starts with is. It starts with pe. What is this? It's a pencil. Pencil. Mm -hmm. Pencil. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a home. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know what that is. Do you recognize it? Mm -mm. It's used for blowing into. Mm. Does that help at all? I don't know. It that. starts with we. Mm. Don't understand. Okay, don't worry about it. We'll just oh. fly through these. I know what that is. Yeah. But I don't remember the na the. Now. Mm -hmm. So she got the first few pictures, the tree, the pencil, she said home here. As soon as we started to get into more kind of infrequent items, like the whistle, not only could she not come up with the word, but she also had no idea what the object was. So this is how we can see that she doesn't just have trouble with word finding, she's actually got a loss of the core kind of conceptual knowledge to help her to even be able to recognize a picture of the thing. And yet, you'll notice that her speech was perfectly articulated. She's able to speak in grammatical sentences. So very different from the first patient that we looked at. And then finally, here's a gentleman with the logopenic variant. Remember, this variant of PPA implicates the phonological system. So uh, these individuals also have a lot of trouble with word finding, but they don't have a loss of core concepts. They have trouble with assembling the sounds for output. And so here you'll he hear him describing the first time he really became aware of this problem. Oh, probably three, three to four years, I started feeling like I would talk, but a word would fall out of the sentence, and so it was no longer a sentence. So it, um, I would just stop, you know, would stop. Mm -hmm. So once that word is gone, it's not a sentence, so just to shut it off, not going to finish. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the, the way I knew I had a problem, I was on my kitchen, and the, the well, I can't say right now, <laughs> the mat that goes on there, where they put, you put your plates on there. And I was looking at it, and I couldn't say what that thing was. And I thought, there, I have a problem. So, so he didn't have any difficulty with knowing what the thing was that he wanted to come up with the name of. but. He just couldn't retrieve the name. And this kind of problem grows more prominent over time and more debilitating, debilitating in these individuals. And you might notice this is, a, this is a young guy. So we're not talking about the kinds of dementias that we, th we think about affecting people in their 70s, 80s, 90s. Progressive aphasia can affect people who are quite young. So how can these patients contribute to our understanding of brain behavior relations for language. We've learned so much from patients who have strokes, what can PPA really contribute to this picture? Well, actually, it, it seems that these individuals can provide converging and complementary evidence regarding brain behavior relations for language. And part of the reason for that is that PPA involves some areas that are rarely damaged in stroke, just because of the nature of the vascular distribution in the brain. For example, these anterior temporal regions, 
that we see affected in the semantic variant of PPA. You can see where there's clearly a loss of tissue here relative to the healthy brain. These regions aren't typically affected in, in a, a very prominent way in individuals with strokes. And yet we've now learned that those regions are really important for semantic or conceptual processing. So what can PPA tell us about certain core language domains like semantics, phonology, and written language? And how do we learn more about that in our patients? Well, I want to show you some of the kinds of tasks that we use with our patients. So semantic tasks, tasks that get at meaning or concepts, are things like picture naming. So tell me what you see in this picture. Um, picture matching tasks. So given the two pictures on the bottom, which of these is more closely associated with the picture on top? Phonological tasks where we ask patients to manipulate sounds in words, things like, given the sounds b, oi, ol, can you put those together and tell me what word that makes? Say fat, now take away f and tell me what's left. Say mouth, now change f to s, things like that. So when we look at these kinds of tasks and we map them onto the brain um, using a technique called voxel-based morphometry, which is similar to some of the techniques that Nina described where we're looking at the relationship statistically between brain volumes and the ability to perform these tasks, what we see are that our phonological tasks seem to be critically reliant on these left hemisphere regions right around what's called the Sylvian fissure, so left perisylvian regions. And our semantic tasks tend to be reliant on the anterior and inferior temporal lobe. When we look at written language, we find that different word types actually require different kinds of processing. So irregular words, words that are spelled um, irregularly, that, that aren't spelled the way they seem that they should be, Things like yacht, where if you sounded it out, you would read it as yatched, are critically reliant on semantic processing. So it seems that you need to be able to actually access, access the concept to be able to remember that memorized spelling that you've learned. Whereas non-words, which are made up but phonologically plausible, are phonologically derived, and you can kind of see why that is. You have to understand which sounds go with which letters in order to be able to sound out a non-word or to be able to write a non-word correctly. So this is the way we get at semantics and phonology through written language. And these processes selectively break down in primary progressive aphasia. So I want to show you these two patients who are reading lists of words aloud. And they demonstrate what's called surface dyslexia. So they have particular difficulty with irregularly spelled words. And it's called surface dyslexia because they really rely on the surface features of the word. Very yeah. Daniel Tail, Wolf, Iceland, Wedding, Chicken, Colonelly, co Colonel, Colonel. What is Colonel? So an irregular word like Colonel, which you or I would be able to pronounce because we've memorized that that particular pattern of letters is pronounced as Colonel, she's not able to access that stored memorized word form, and so she's sounding it out incorrectly and doesn't recognize it, doesn't recognize it on the page, and of course doesn't recognize it when she reads it incorrectly either. Nerve, Sue, Sword, Shoe. So again, Sword, Sue, things like that. People are, they're, they're relying on the surface features of the word, simply converting letters into sounds the way little kids do, right? Just pronouncing things the way they appear on the page. And of course in English, because there are so many irregular words, that gets you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> 
Now, conversely, in the logopenic variant of PPA, remember this is the variant that has underlyingly a core phonological processing problem. We ask them to uh, read and spell non-words, and they have particular difficulty. I don't have a patient clip to show you this, but this is the reading, reading non-words performance of an individual with phonological dyslexia. So she's asked to read things like flig, and she produces figgy, hoach, hosesh, glope, globe, cheed, cheered, smowed, smoky, etc. And you might be seeing a pattern. She seems to be converting a lot of these made up words into real words. And these are errors that we call lexicalizations. So for people who have a hard time with this process of sounding things out, they tend to just revert back to words that they already know, to convert these non-words into real word or real word-like things. And when we look at these processes and how they map onto the brain, we find that reading and spelling of non-words, which we know to be phonologically mediated, maps onto left parasylvian regions, and reading and spelling of irregular words maps onto these temporal lobe regions. So this probably looks familiar. One of the things that we've learned about sort of through the lens of progressive aphasia is that spoken language and written language are critically reliant on the same networks and PPA has helped us to understand this better. So you might be thinking, well, this is all well and good, this is very interesting, but I, like doctors Marco and Dronkers, am also very interested in what we can possibly do to help these people. These are often young people who are experiencing a really debilitating decline in speech and language, and I'm sure you all have some insight into the fact that speech and language are so critical to how we express ourselves, how we relate to other people. And you can only imagine what it would be like to, to one day realize that you're slowly losing these processes. So there are actually people, including our lab at UCSF, who are investigating treatment approaches, speech and language treatment approaches. And a number of these appear to be promising. Some of these are similar to approaches that have been tried in stroke patients, and some of them are novel. The treatment effects can be substantial and lasting, which is an important finding because there's been a lot of pessimism on the part of clinicians, on the part of insurance companies, on the part of physicians about whether it's even a good idea to treat people whose brains are sick and getting worse. They're just going to get worse is kind of the attitude. But we find that behavioral treatment can result in changes in speech and language behaviors that I said are, as I said, are lasting. And we can also see changes in the brain when we do neuroimaging that re reflect some degree of rewiring, even in a sick brain. So I want to show you some treatment results briefly from the different variants of progressive aphasia. So here, um, you're looking at the treatment results from one individual who underwent naming treatment. This is an individual with semantic PPA, which again is an impairment of concepts. And really one of the primary complaints for these people is that I just can't get the words out anymore. And not just uh, names of people and places like we all have some sometimes have trouble coming up with, but rather even very common nouns, as you saw, like whistle and comb. So we're working on naming with these individuals, and the idea behind it is that we're trying to take advantage of spared systems in order to give a boost to the impaired systems. So here we're taking an advantage of the spared phonological system in conjunction with other spared systems like autobiographical memory, like written language, which tends to be relatively spared, the ability to um, process orthography. And what you see in the data is that, so here's pretreatment, the ability to name this set of items, both spoken and written naming, is at floor. Post-treatment, so the ability to relearn these vocabulary items is, is clearly robust and maintained at three months post-treatment and six months post-treatment and even beyond. So it's very encouraging. And what we think might be going on in the brain, now keep in mind that what I'm about to show you is not a pre- and post-treatment MRI, but rather some MRI results from a different study that are kind of helping me to postulate what might be going on as a result of treatment. So remember our networks here. And we know that in these individuals, there's atrophy in the semantic parts of the brain here. So what might be happening 
as we work on speech and language through treatment is something like this. So this is a neuroimaging result actually from a reading paper in individuals with the semantic variant of PPA. And what we see is that they have compensatory and increased activity in the phonological system, which is the system that you see in red. And so what might be happening is that when our individuals are trying to come up with the names of things, that they're actually recruiting these phonological areas to help them name things. And so there may be increased activity in spared regions. Now looking at treatment in the logopenic variant, remember this is the variant that has impaired phonology. In, in these individuals, we're trying to take advantage of spared meaning systems. So giving them a strategy like when you can't come up with the name of it, try to tell me everything that you can about it. So name all the semantic features that you can. That not only seems to kind of lower the threshold for being able to come up with the name, sort of activating all those semantic features, but also it's a really useful strategy. So if I said something to you like, oh, I just can't remember the name of this stuff, but you know, um, you drink it in the morning, it's dark and hot and kind of makes you feel jittery if you drink too much of it, you would know exactly what I was talking about even if I never retrieved the word. So that's the kind of training we might do to try to take advantage of semantics in people who have trouble with accessing phonology and assembling phonology for output. Now in this particular study that I did with Dr. Beeson at the University of Arizona, we were training an individual with logopenic PPA to generate words within certain semantic categories. And what we saw is that for trained categories, there was improvement post-treatment here, and that this was pretty well maintained over time. And also we saw improvement in untrained categories, which suggests that there's some degree of generalization of the strategy, which is really nice. And for this study, we actually did have pre and post treatment MRI. So in this individual, we saw the characteristic pattern of atrophy affecting those phonological regions. And what we found in looking at what his brain was doing during naming tasks, so comparing pretreatment functional MRI to post-treatment fun functional MRI, we saw that this area in the frontal lobe became much more active post-treatment. And one of the things that we think this area of the brain is critical for is helping to access semantic concepts, which are critical for naming. So we were training him on a semantic strategy, and he seems to be using this region that's critical for accessing semantic concepts down in the temporal lobe, which, of course, is a spared region for him. And then finally, in non-fluent PPA, so these individuals often just have an articulatory problem, difficulty with motor speech that becomes increasingly debilitating over time to the point where they can't articulate words anymore. So during therapy, we try to take advantage of relatively spared language processing through tasks like oral reading. So reading of text aloud, which can provide a nice context in which to practice articulation of things like complex multisyllabic words, which tend to be the most difficult in people who have articulatory problems. So for this kind of therapy, we have the individual read aloud until they encounter a word that they stumble on. So they have to be able to detect that they've made an error. When they detect it, they stop. They break the word down into its constituent syllables, so ka, ta, stra, fi, and tap those syllables out sometimes to help them understand rhythmically what should be going on in the word. Practice that over and over again until you're able to say the word fluidly and correctly, catastrophe, and then return to the sentence level, try to get the word in context. The, the meeting was a catastrophe. And then continue on with reading until you encounter another difficult, usually multisyllabic word. So when we look at the effects of this kind of reading treatment over time, so this is reading of untrained text, you see that this is actually proportion of multisyllabic words produced in error, which it, this is the level at pretreatment, considerably lower at post-treatment. And you see that it's still significantly below pretreatment at up to a year post-treatment. So this is a lasting change. Okay, so to sum up 
I hope that I've shown you not only what PPA is, that it's a slow decline in speech and language caused by neurodegenerative disease, which is very different from other kinds of dementia that we see, that semantic, phonologic, and motor systems can be selectively impaired, which helps to provide a unique window into brain behavior relations for, for language, in part because of the unique areas of the brain that are affected in PPA relative to stroke patients. And finally, that treatment for speech and language can have lasting benefits in these individuals who are undergoing a slow decline and that the mechanism for treatment seems to be, and we hope to be, taking advantage of spared cognitive and neural systems. So I'd like to acknowledge, first and foremost, our, partic our research participants who um, are amazingly generous with their time, and my lab at UCSF, as well as the lab that I used to work with at the University of Arizona and continue to collaborate with, our uh, research funding, and here's the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF. So it really does take a village to do this kind of research. So thank you. And Nina and I will both take questions now. The question was uh, that uh, in, our, in the videos that I showed during my presentation, the patients didn't seem to be that frustrated. <clears throat> and uh, the fact is, in the early stages, uh, of their recovery, they're very, very frustrated. Uh, patients are usually uh, also dealing with a fair amount of depression uh, as well um, because of the sudden change in their communicative abilities. So the tapes that I was showing you were really more five, seven years post-onset where those individuals have learned that this is what they have to work with. And so they are pretty much resigned to what it is, but they maximize it as much as they can. Yeah, thank you for the question. There's no theoretical reason why lack of sleep would cause a permanent problem. But lack of but in a with a brain injury, um, uh, f fatigue is a feature of a stroke, for example. So particularly in the early stages after a stroke, patients are very, very tired. It's as if, you know, it's as if you broke your leg and now you're trying to run a marathon because you want to communicate the way you were communicating before, but you can't. It's not coming out, so you have to work harder and harder, and of course that makes you tired. Um, we encourage people to take naps and just kind of go with it. Um, you know, do as much therapy as you can and work at it as much as you can, but if you're tired, then you're tired for a good reason and to, to go ahead and get some good sleep. But the lack of sleep itself shouldn't cause the problem to continue. Well, I can answer for stroke, and you can answer for PPA. Um, generally, uh, what we've learned is that if you speak multiple languages, if you ha sustain a brain injury, all of those languages will become affected. But there are unique cases where you can see um, more of a disruption in one language than in another, but it's almost always in the vocabulary of that language. So, for example, you don't lose the ability to use grammar in one language, uh, you know, or as Dr. Henry said, he said the ability to use um, semantic knowledge in one language, but phonology in another. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that, that holds for progressive aphasia as well. And actually, we have a number of bilingual patients. And they're also, so on, on top of this, what Dr. Dronkers just described, I think there's also an aspect of which language was learned first and which language is primary or used the most at the time of the brain injury or when the, the PPA first sort of starts to appear, that languages that are not used as much don't seem to be as robust to damage, and so people find, even if their first language was, say, Spanish and they moved to the United States um, when they were very young, even though Spanish was their first language, if they're not using it frequently, then it becomes very, it's more vulnerable to damage. But you're not gonna see that one language is entirely spared and, and, and the other is impaired. So I don't think it's a, a matter of semantics failing. I think it's a problem initially with access, because if you, you would probably be perfectly able to describe that entity that you weren't able to come up with the name of. You'd be able to recognize a picture of it. Um, and, and what you described, actually, is something that we encourage 
patients to do. So in, an, in addition to doing that kind of semantic description to try to activate the word, we also encourage them to think about whatever residual lexical knowledge they have. Maybe it's partial word form knowledge, and we find that healthy people as well as people who have strokes and who have PPA can often tell us things about the word form, like you just described beautifully. So I know that it starts with a certain letter. Um, they can often tell you how long the word is, things like that, whether it's a short word or a long word. Even with, with um, a high degree of accuracy, how many syllables are in the word. And so these are, not, these, are not, these are people who really have a problem with accessing phonology and assembling phonology for output. Um, and so we try to encourage people to take advantage of that, much like you just described your process. It's amazing, though, how people don't intuitively think to do those things to try to help themselves. So kudos. There's literature on um, how well people are able to use gesture. It seems to be um, in people who don't have some kind of uh, motor problem or limb apraxia where they have trouble telling their limbs what to do motorically, it seems to be really spared. And so it can be used in a couple of different ways. Sometimes people use it spontaneously, and that's great. But I'm always amazed, as I was just saying, at how people don't always intuitively use the strategies that we, we think they should. So um, we train people to use gestures, and that serves as an alternative mode of communication. Gestures can be very informative. Like Dr. Dronkers was saying, the gentleman with the stereotyped tono, tono, tono really conveys a lot with his hands. So that's very important. But there are also treatments designed to try to tap into that spared motor system, to try to use some kind of intersystemic uh, linking or facilitation to try to tie the gesture to speech, to try to help use the limb uh, usually the left limb, to engage the right hemisphere, which is spared, to try to uh, help with articulation and word production. And there is some evidence that that may be a productive approach. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah, good question. Uh, we're all, we're, we've just been, been given the signal that we're oh. allowed one more question before the filming ends. I'm perfectly happy to stay longer for those who would like to ask more questions, provided my, uh, my ride doesn't mind. <laughs> <clears throat> so one, one more question. Uh, yes, sir. We are learning a lot about the causes. Um, and, it seem, and I didn't go into this, but what the Memory and Aging Center, where a lot of the research that I showed you is taking place, is interested not only in the, what we see on the surface, the behaviors, but also how those, as I said, map onto different patterns of atrophy in the brain, and then to underlying molecular changes in the brain. And um, what we're not entirely sure about is why certain circuits are affected. So one of the, the logopenic variant of PPA is actually, um, in most cases, a variant, an atypical variant of Alzheimer's disease. But why Alzheimer's disease is attacking language cortex rather than memory cortex, which we see in typical Alzheimer's dementia, is something that we're still trying to learn more about. But it does seem like the different PPA variants are, are pretty highly predictable of different underlying molecular problems and different diseases. I think we'll have to stop there, and we thank you very, very much for your keen attention. <laughs>